We are back in the keynote session. And do you know that I actually have a Mac with my own face here, you see? Somebody actually gave me a Mac, Fraunhofer IAF sent me a Mac that actually had myself painted on it. Thank you so much, Fraunhofer IAF. We go now, we go to Berlin. And the reason we go to Berlin is because I want to talk to one of the key companies that we have in fluorescence spectroscopy and fluorescence microscopy and photon counting and many other different technologies. We want to understand how EPIC members can help PicoQuant be even greater than already is. And for taking that challenge of explaining data med needs, I have with me Christian Olsler from PicoQuant, all the way from Berlin, Christian, good afternoon. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to the green company, goes to PicoQuant. Thank you very much for having me here invited to this really nice event and to the Photonics Plus. It's really a pleasure to be here and uh, to present you some maybe important and interesting stuff. So let's start with the presentation. So, um, and of course, turn on the video that was mentioned before. <laughs> so my talk today is about non-destructive photoluminescence investigations of photovoltaic devices with high spatial resolution and with different microscope techniques. So let's see. At first, I give you a brief overview about time-resolved photoluminescence techniques that you get an idea what's possible and what's the state of the art. Then I will go on with uh, explaining a little bit about fluorescence lifetime imaging, phosphorescence lifetime imaging, and of course, time resolved photoluminescence in combination with a spectrometer, for instance, on example of a ZIGS solar cell. So ZIGS is a special type of material which is integrated in the new types of solar cells with a good efficiency and it's really promising. And at least I want to show you and explain you a little bit about the new technique, it's called carrier diffusion. So you detect lifetimes and you can just follow the kinetics of uh, different uh, formed free mobile carriers, which is interesting for semiconductors and even for devices. So let's have a look. Okay, at first, well, time resolved for the luminescence. So what are typical applications and what types of techniques can you use? So here it's shown FLIM. FLIM means fluorescence lifetime imaging. So you've got a microscope, you scan over an area, and you detect the lifetime. This can be used, for instance, for a circuit board to check the quality of these issues. And this is also can be used for the quality control of a solar cell, for instance, a perovskite solar cell, so to check how you prepared it. A, are there some problems during the preparation process? For instance, here you see there's a huge blue circle spot inside. This is an air bubble. So the preparation process was not completed, successful, or yeah, there was a problem in this. So you get it. It's not a homogeneous structure. With a scan over the area, you get the idea where well, you have to optimize it a little bit. And of course, there's also the possibility to check devices like an OLED display. So this was from a mobile phone. We scanned it in a wide field. And then you can get an idea about the arrangement of the pixels, for instance, the blue, the red, and the green one. And of course, the quality of this is everything fine. And so it's a kind of quality check. And next to this, there's also the possibility to do PLIM, phosphorescence lifetime imaging. Because not each material emits in the nanosecond time scale. Some different devices and materials emit in the in the microsecond, even in the millisecond time scale. And this is also important to get an idea because you can uh, increase the efficiencies and the, the properties by this. And uh, for instance, a white light LED, you want to have a bright shining uh, device. And uh, here, uh, transitions and materials are important with a long lived excited state. On the other hand, there's also the possibility to use up conversion materials which are promising because here you excite in the NIR and you get in a signal in the UVVIS. So it's really interesting for instance for 3D printing. So deeper penetration depth and still have a lot of efficiency and no problems with other light. And finally you can combine a microscope with a spectrometer. Why do you do this? Because there are different properties of materials, different characteristics, and you want to get a better idea about it. For instance, a spectral scan. So how does the emission bands change? For instance, uh, a power dependent process. So when you change the laser power, you get different emission bands, different intensity ratios, and this is interesting and really important to follow up and uh, yeah, to investigate. 
next to this. You can also detect lifetimes of these different bands, and uh, then you get a better idea about the properties, the processes, the photophysical properties, and so on. And this is also matching for such called single molecule detection. So here's an example. So it's molybdenum disulfide. It is such called new material. It's a highly promising material. It's a TMD. Transition metal decalcanides. So there are different uh, types of material in this group and those form flakes. And you have to check if it's a single flake or is a few stacked flake. And uh, the single flakes, the single layer flakes do have really promising, interesting properties, which means they can act as a single emitter. And depending on the temperature, they act as a semiconductor too. And um, so you need to investigate and to check and to characterize this material that you can use it later in different types of devices. Okay, so let's have a look to the film and to the film. Okay, what is film and film imaging? So usually when you investigate material, you check the intensity. Does this material or uh, this material or this molecule emit light? Then when it emit light, there are some properties on this. So you want to have an idea about the intensity and of course the lifetime. So how long is this excited state uh, present? And you can combine it finally also in combination with a uh, polarized light source for anisotropy measurements. This is also interesting for, for solids or for different types of bio applications. So when we use now this information and do a mapping, we get these really nice images. Means you get an intensity image, and when you combine it with a pulsed light source, you get also the lifetime information from this. And you can combine both intensity and lifetime image in a hybrid image, which provides you much more and deeper information. And of course, when you use two detectors with an, uh, with an anisotropy or polarizing beam splitter, well, you get also additional anisotropy information if required. So from our lifetime image, we can check about the position of molecules or are there already single molecules? And of course, you get an idea about the lifetime distribution in this area. Next to this, you can also do PLIM to investigate crystals. For instance, this is a um, ruthenium crystal or upconversion nanoparticles. And another really interesting idea and technique is the carrier diffusion. So you keep the excitation spot constant and you scan around the area of this excitation spot. And by this, you get uh, additional information about the mobility of the carrier inside this material. So from a PLIM image, the next step is a new other technique, it's called correlation. So what you can do is you can follow the molecules within the confocal volume, for instance, diffusion coefficients of different molecules like biomolecules, uh, proteins or something like this. Or you can use it also for correlation measurements of single emitter. Are there already single emitter or not? And you need, of course, an analysis technique. We can provide a really interesting thing. It's called pattern matching. So you do not check only the intensity or just the lifetime. You also include the such called pre-exponential factors. So usually a lifetime has a weight factor. This is a pre-exponential factor that gives you an idea how much percent of this lifetime is part of the distribution of the lifetime distribution. And when you check this in consideration with your image, then you get new and highly structured information from this regular flim or flim image doesn't matter so now you get new structures new bright uh, yeah areas or um, spots which were not visible before because when you just look on the lifetime alone so this is a really powerful tool to to check interactions of different structures other interactions energy transfer or anything like this Okay, I mentioned before the combination with the spectrometer. So you get next to the temporal resolution, the spectral information. And of course, the next following step is you can do also different types of analysis like a time trace, following the, the information or a molecule over time, you get an idea about blinking or uh, anti bunching and power dependencies. This is a really important thing for semiconducting materials or materials which do show 
power dependence properties like for up conversion. And all of these are possible with microscopes. This is no problem. Okay, but what is required to get Dutch information, to get these images? So usually you have to think about the microscope. So you can start with a wide feed microscope or you can operate with a confocal microscope. This depends on the type of sample and of course the size of your sample and what you want to see. The spatial resolution is a key point. So like I said, wide field or confocal. And of course, interesting is also in combination with a, micro, uh, with a spectrometer for a uh, spectral resolution. So the spatial resolution depends on the chosen microscope, is the wide field or confocal, and of course on the scanner. Because when you want to have a high spatial resolution, you need a good scanner with a really good resolution. Therefore, you need an XYZ piezo scanner, fine scanner. On the other hand, when you want to investigate larger structures like seven to seven centimeter or a two inch wafer or something like this, then you can go with a wide range scanner. There's no problem. You just have to check, everything works, and then you get an image within a few minutes. And to get an image, you need, of course, the information about the emission range and the lifetime, because now it's important to know what type of detector you should use or which is important to use. Different detectors do have different properties. It means different quantum efficiencies, different lifetime uh, response, which means sometimes it's important to combine different detector types to have the best properties or the best setup for, the, yeah, for your application. And of course, a TCSPC means electronic for counting the photons is really important. And here, a good time resolution in combination with a short dead time is really, really necessary because you want to do an image scan. Therefore, you have to do it fast and you want to collect as much as photons as possible. Therefore, the dead time of this counting electronic should be less that you can do a fast scanning. Okay. When the setup is done and we have got a great setup, which works fine, you want to get an idea about the results. So here is, for instance, the result for the CIGS solar cell. This was an intensity image taken by a CCD camera, excitation in the green, emission in the NIR, so at 1,250 nanometer. And we used a wide field setup with low laser power. So you see, this is, uh, ah, it looks rough, the surface, and uh, there are some holes inside, and you've got a different distribution, different lifetimes in the region of the holes and so on. So th the surface was not homogeneous. When you change now the laser power to higher power, the surface looks much more smooth. The reason for this is you saturate the trap states within this material. This is a kind of semiconducting material. And now by high laser power, you saturate the, the traps and the defects, and now the surface looks much smoother. This can be shown here in the emission kinetic. You see the red curve is with low power, so a lot of defects. You have got a shorter lifetime compared to the saturated stuff and the saturated uh, surface. And of course, the intensity will change too. You see it here in this image, in this spectrum. So with high power, you get a really good uh, emission uh, signal. Okay. Next to the wide field, you can do this with a uh, confocal image too. So you get a deeper insight into this material, into the surface, and of course, a higher spatial resolution. And when you combine it with a spectrometer, you can scan over the emission range. So this is now a such called time-resolved emission spectrum. So scanning over an emission wavelength range and taking your decays at different emission positions will provide you this image. And then you get a better idea about different structures, interactions, and stuff like this. This is also really, really helpful for different materials. If you've got a mixture, you get an idea about the single components inside only by truss measurements. And Finally, have a look to the carrier diffusion I mentioned before. So carrier diffusion is for photovoltaics or layer structures really interesting because you want to follow the kinetic and of course the qualities of the trap states. So you form carriers by light inducing. So you can use for this a CW laser or a pulsed laser. And the diffusion length is the average between the carrier generation and the recombination processes. So 
You can calculate the diffusion length pretty simple by taking the photolinear sense lifetime you can detect. So, and by this, you get a diffusion coefficient and a diffusion length. So, thumb throw, really simple. As longer the lifetime, as higher diffusion length. So, and this gives you a good idea about the quality of your semiconductor material because the, the, uh, the lifetime is a magnitude of the recombination process. So, okay. The recombination process does not mean there have to be trap states. A trap state is also a doping, which means when I modify the properties of the semiconductor material, I induce a doping, and the doping is a kind of trap state. And by this, you reduce again the lifetime and, of course, the carrier diffusion path length. So high doping means faster recombination processes, shorter lifetimes, shorter diffusion length. So for perovskite, it's a really interesting material and actually really hot material inside in the um, solar cell uh, world. So lifetime between 10 to 100 nanoseconds mean a diffusion length of one to three micrometer, which is really good. Okay, so determination of the diffusion length by the photoluminescence lifetime is a really interesting technique for photovoltaics and semiconductors. And of course, out of this and uh, the power dependencies, because you can change the power of the laser, you get an idea about the recombination rates, recombination states, and so on. But how does it look like in a, in, in a setup? So, as I mentioned before, you keep the excitation spot constant, and now you do not move the sample. What you do is you move the pinhole. The pinhole is for the confocal setup really important, and now you scan the pinhole around the excitation spot of the laser. And by this, this is shown here, this is an example from Berlin, it's a quantum well. So layer structure, different materials, so different uh, transitions. And this is how we realized it. So we used a 485 nanometer laser head, uh, laser. So we excited the sample, we got an emission, pro, uh, emission signal in the region of 740 nanometer. And now the black box is the XY scanner. This is directly mounted in front of the emission fiber of this microscope. And so we can scan the emission fiber, which acts as pinhole, to get the following image. This is the carrier diffusion image. In the center, you see the blue spot. This is the laser spot. Here, a high amount of mobile carriers is formed. So this is the highest concentration and the shortest lifetime. So when the carriers move and started in their dynamics, you will get an light blue circle, you get the green circle, the yellow one, the orange, and the red one. And these are areas with different lifetimes. This is shown here in this diagram. So there's always a spot, and then uh, the, the decay is shown here, uh, printed in this diagram. And you see, it's completely different to the blue one. So for the red one, you've got a race, which means this is the formation process of this state, where it deactivates in an emission, and this is uh, finally the decay. But you can use the rays for a calculation of the formation of the state, and this is part of the carrier diffusion. So it is really simple to measure the lifetime of the carriers, and of course, to follow this kinetic, and this is independent of the signal. It is not wavelength dependent, because you just add a scanner in front of the pinout. That's it. And by this confocal setup, you get additional high spatial, resol spatial resolution, so you can really follow up and uh, check the different structures within this device. Okay, to sum up, there are really, you get new information which are provided by different photoluminescent based microscopic techniques. For instance, fluorescent lifetime imaging or phosphorescent lifetime imaging. Imaging. When you combine those techniques with a spectrometer, you can do time reserved photoluminescence imaging. And of course, you can use also carrier diffusion to get additional information about the material you want to investigate. So don't worry, there's no need to be excited or just to be scared about this. These are not techniques only for experts. There's, these are already commercial and simple to use solutions available. So just Use the software which is provided, and then you can start. So, 
Oops. Thank, Thank you very you much for your so attention. Much. Christian, that was that was fantastic, and I really have to say, I love I love this company. I, I really love what you guys are doing, and what your characterization of the material, your characterization of the three five material solar cell there, and being able to measure the carrier lifetime almost instantaneously, that would have saved me ten years ago, three months of work in my PhD. So I would have really appreciated having having that. Uh, ten, I'm a bit older than that, but I'm gonna say ten for people not to know my my age. Uh, but now I want to. Ask ask about what this meeting is about, which is cooperations. When it comes to fluorescence microscopy, for me, there are two challenges. It's the detector and the scanning. Uh, when it comes to the detectors, uh, you make fantastic photon counters. But I would like to know, I would like to know what are the trends in fluorescence microscopy, what are the challenges for the detection, and where do you see this industry going? And is anybody talking about SPADs, so just throwing data out there? Well, this is really an important point, which type of detector you're choosing. You can use a photomultiplier. This is the old version. I mean, this is really not the actual state of the art detector. A photomultiplier is really interesting when you want to go to the UV, but UV is really critical for microscopy. Um, another detector type is such called hybrid detector. It's a combination of an avalanche photodiode with a uh, regular PMT. And here you've got the advantage of both detector types because you've got the advantage of the APD and the good. Uh, signal uh, enhancement of the PMT. And the advantage is really good time resolution. So we're talking about 100 picoseconds, not 180 to a regular PMT, and no after pulsing. This is important because this after pulsing signal is really nasty sometimes in the region of 8 to 10 nanoseconds. So uh, you've got always this shoulder. And this is really a problem sometimes when you want to do analysis, but hybrid detectors do not have this after pulsing. So you get your pure signal really good. But they can be used only for the visible region. So you yeah. will to the visible when you go closer to the NIR, ah, you come in a really critical area for this <laughs> emission signal detection. You're really limited to, uh, to the spot detectors. There are some companies which offer a red sensitive spot detector, which works really good. And uh, Lifetime resolution is also fine. This is the only chance to combine it with a microscope. But there is another type of detector available. Um, but uh, the price is a little bit horrible. Go, go, go ahead. We don't care. Tell me. I can afford it. OK, OK. So um, this is a such called single quantum nano wire detector. Yeah. This is, is, is really, 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 a really nice detector. I but love it. Price, but uh, this is uh, the price and the size. Eh? The size as well. No, the, the size is, is fine. It's, 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 it's smaller. It's, it's OK. You can handle it. The time resolution is brilliant, better than 50 picoseconds. And of course, the sensitivity or the whole NR range to up to 1,800 nanometer. Uh, it's really, really awesome. But the price of over 100,000. <laughs> If, if anybody from Single Quantum in Delft is watching, like, hello, I love you guys. You're fantastic. You're doing a fantastic job. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to confocal microscopy, because I love, I love real time, real time monitoring in process yeah. monitoring. I love that. And with confocal microscopy, I'm always worried because with some of the tissues, you actually can have photo destruction, especially when you want to go really fast. Uh, how, how, I know that you've done a lot of work on this with certain partners. So can you can you illuminate me a little bit without photo destructing yeah. me? Yeah, this is no problem because um, we enhance our efficiencies and uh, data acquisition time. What I mentioned before is a counting electronic. You need a counting electronic with less dead time because uh, usually you've got counting electronic in the region of 50 nanoseconds, 80 nanoseconds dead time, so it takes endlessly. Um, we have got a new counting electronic with a dead time per channel of 650 picoseconds and less, which means yeah. <laughs> it's really real time that I on the fly. And in combination with a good detector with a low dead time, you can really get kind of lifetime images and really real time. And uh, in combination with, for instance, and such called Galvo scanner, yeah. you can uh, get uh, frame rates of over one kilohertz. So uh, a lot of frames, a lot of images and a really, really fast time. And there's no photo damage because also the laser can be triggered by this. And if there's no image, the laser is stopped. This can be also realized. And by this, you can drop down the, the risk for photo damage. 
the, the, the organizer of Fleet Events, they are once again for the, I don't know, 10th time in the last two days, telling me that I'm running out of time. Guys, you have to wait because this important this question is coming, it's really important. Uh, when it comes to the, to, the, to, the, to the semiconductor industry, for many years, it was SEM, SEM, and SEM. That's it. And now, in the last three years, I have seen that, that companies like Sensofar combining different modes. I've seen the 2P and 3P, 2 photon, 3 photon microscopy coming in. I'm seeing new things. I'm really excited. I would like to check from Pico Kwang if you are half excited, as excited as I am. And what do you think are the trends? Do you think uh, we, we are taking over SEM a little, little by little? Yes, because with the SEM, you get just a, a topologic image. You do not get information about the uh, electronic properties, about the uh, carrier diffusion and uh, mobilities. And of course, this material is sometimes also um, temperature dependent. So you need, um, for instance, a cryostat to heat it up, cool it down. And of course, another thing is um, single emitter. And for this purpose, you need a high resolution confocal fluorescence microscope. And you do anti-bunching. And this is only possible with two detectors of the same type, 50-50 beam splitter, and then checking if you get the anti-bunching dip or not. And this cannot be done and realized with the SEM. So, and uh, how do you want to prove is this a single emitter or not? And um, I mean, there are different materials like uh, diamond with a N resender inside, or um, for instance, like I mentioned before, there's a TMD, so the transition metal decalconides. Yeah. Really, really interesting material, and this is... You so said it they, very well. The semiconductor industry is coming, is actually bringing new materials to the, yeah. to the semiconductor exactly. process. And yeah. this, is, this, is where, this is where SEM is just not good enough. Sorry, SEM friends. You are just not good enough. You are just no. not good enough. And Pico Quant, it is fantastic. Fantastic. One final thing, please. One challenge. Please give me one thing that the EPIC members can help you with. Yes, one. Scanning, lasers, optics. Yeah, this is, um, there's nearly no limitation. I love putting you on the spot. That was really, truly really great. I had so much fun with this presentation and now you're really telling me off. Thank you so much. Once again, the Green Company, all the way from Berlin, Pico Quant. Thank you very much.